1 Peter 1, 6 or 7, it says, be truly glad. That means this, be excited, be joyful. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure trials for a little while. These trials will show you that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is much more valuable than gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Now, life has a way of dealing out difficulties. And one of the things that's going to happen to all of us, it's not if trouble comes, it's when trouble comes. It's how do you respond when difficulties come, when testings, when temptations come your way. Your choice, the way you make decisions, define who you are. Now, George, again, has great ambitions of becoming somebody great, uh, of getting out of the little podunk town of Bedford Falls. And so we see that, but one of the things that defines George is that George actually has a deep love for people. And so what happens is George goes through a series of events where he chooses the needs of the people around him over his own will, over his own desires. And ultimately, George has a wonderful life. He just can't see it. Life has a way of dealing out difficulties. So you can either have lemons and be bitter and become a mean old grumpy person. Or you can take the difficulties that you face and see them as good, add a little sweetness to it, and you've got lemonade and life is worth living. So part of what this movie's intended to do is to change you, to have a little time of reflection and say, is my life really that bad? Is my spouse really that bad? Is my job that bad? Are my children that? And it's like it helps you to refocus and see the good, not just the bad. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. So what, what George does is he imita imitates the life of Christ. Philippians chapter 2 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Now we're going to talk about that vain conceit here in a little bit. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. In other words, look out for the interests of other people, not just what you think is good or what's important but what other people's needs are. Not looking to your own interest, but to each of you, to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ did. Well, what is the mindset that Jesus Christ had? Verse 6, Who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Jesus, being fully God, being fully man, could have done anything or whatever he wanted. But he chose intentionally to give his life, to become a servant, and ultimately to live a life of obedience. And what Scripture says is that Jesus was tempted just like you and I are. But when he faced temptation, he chose to do what God wanted versus what his own flesh would have desired. He chose what God's will was. So God would say that is what we too as believers in Christ should do. Now, one of my favorite scriptures when, when I'm confronted with difficulties, uh, you know, just at being a pastor in any given week, we have somebody who's lost a spouse or a loved one or a mother or a dad. We've gone through tragedies. We've gone through difficulties. And part of being pastors, we have to help people. Part of being believers, we have to learn how to help and comfort people. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5 says that, that we're able to comfort others in the way that God has comforted us. Again, God doesn't waste a pain. God doesn't waste a shame. So when we learn, when, when life does deal us some lemons or some difficulties, and we learn to turn into God and find God's strength in the midst of them, if it's a sickness, if it's a, 
a marriage situation, a financial situation, a health issue, as we turn to the Lord, find strength from Him, believe God to move in power, then we are able not only to help ourselves, but to help other people. Life becomes worth living. So what we're going to do is, is uh, we're going to go ahead and run the first video. Who's that? That's your problem, George Bailey. A boy? That's him when he was 12, back in 1919. Something happens here you'll have to remember later on. Here comes the scare painting. My kid brother, Harry Bailey. I'm not scared. saved his brother's life that day. But he caught a bad cold, which infected his left ear. Cost him his hearing in that ear. You made up your mind yet? I'll take chocolate. With coconuts? I don't like coconuts. You don't like coconuts? Say, Brainless, don't you know where coconuts come from? Look at here. From Tahiti, the Fiji Islands, the Coral Sea. A new magazine. I never saw it before. Of course you never. Only us explorers can get it. I've been nominated for membership in the National Geographic Society. Is this the year you can't hear on? George Bailey, I'll love you till the day I die. I'm going out exploring someday. You watch. And I'm going to have a couple of harems and maybe three or four wives. Wait and see. <whistles> sent this over. He said to float away to Happy Land on the bubbles. Oh, look at oh, this old bush. By the way, uh, where are you two going on this here now, honeymoon? Where are we going? Look at this. There's the kitty, Ernie. Here, come on, count her, Mary. Oh, I feel like a bootlegger's wife. Look! You know what we're gonna do? We're gonna shoot the works. A whole week in New York, a whole week in Bermuda, the highest hotels, the oldest champagne, the richest caviar, the hottest music, and the prettiest wife. Don't look now, but there's something funny going on over there at the bank, George. I've never really seen one, but that's got all the earmarks of being a run. I got $242 in here, and $242 isn't going to break anybody. Okay, Tom. All right. Here you are. You sign this. You get your money in 60 days. For 60 days? Well, now, that's what you agreed to when you bought your shares. Tom, 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 did you get your money? No. Well, I did. Old man Potter will pay 50 cents on the dollar for every share you got. 50 cents on the dollar? Yes, cash. Well, what do you say? No, Tom, you have to stick to your original agreement. Now, give us 60 days on this. Okay, thing. Randall. Are you going to Potter's? Better to get half than nothing. Tom! Tom! Randall, wait a minute. Now, wait. Now, listen. Now, listen to me. I, I beg of you not to do this thing. If Potter gets a hold of this building and a loan, there'll never be another decent house built in this town. He's already got charge of the bank, he's got the bus line, he's got the department stores, and now he's after us. Why? Well, it's very simple, because we're cutting in on his business, that's why. And because he wants to keep you living in his slums and paying the kind of rent he decides. But my husband hasn't worked in over a year, and I need money. How am I going to live until the bank opens? I got doctor bills to pay. I need cash. I can't I keep my kids on faith. I've got to have... How much do you need? Hey! I got $2,000. Here's $2,000. This will tide us over to the bank reopens. All right, Tom, how much do you need? $242. No, Tom, just enough to tide you over to the bank reopens. I'll take $242. There you are. That'll close my account. Your account's still here. That's a loan. 
Okay. All right, Ed. Well, I got $300 here, George. All right, now, Ed, what will it take until the bank opens? What, what do you need? Well, I, I suppose $20. $20. Now you're talking. All right. Thanks, Ed. That's fine. All right, now, Miss Thompson, how much do you want? But it's your own money, now, George. Don't mind about that. How much do you want? Well, now? I can get along with $20, all right. $20. <laughs> And I'll sign there the paper. You don't have to sign anything. I know you. You pay when you can. That's okay. All right, Miss Davis. George is being tempted to make about twenty thousand, which well, is three hundred fifty thousand dollars in today's equivalency. We'll find out sooner or later. But just what exactly do you want to see me about? <laughs> oh, George, now that's just what I like so much about you, <clears throat> George. I am an old man, and most people hate me, but I don't like them either, so that makes it all even. You know just as well as I do that I run practically everything in this town, but the Bailey Building and Loan. You know also that for a number of years I've been trying to get control of it, or kill it, but I haven't been able to do it. You have been stopping me. In fact, you have beaten me, George. And as anyone in this county can tell you, that takes some doing. Well, what's your point, Mr. Potter? My point? My point is I want to hire you. Hire me? Yeah, I want you to manage my affairs, run my properties. George, I'll start you out at $20,000 a year. $20,000 a year? Well, Mr. Potter, I... I, I know I ought to jump at the chance, but I, I just, uh, I, I wonder if, if it would be possible for you to give me 24 hours to think it over. Sure, sure, sure. You, you go on home and talk about it to your wife. I'd like to do that. Yeah, yes. then in the meantime, I'll draw up the papers. All right, sir. Okay, George. <laughs> okay, Mr. Potter. No, oh, no, no, wait a minute here. Wait a minute. I don't need 24 hours. I, I don't have to talk to anybody. I know right now, and the answer's no, no. Doggone it. You sit around here, and you spin your little webs, and you think the whole world revolves around you and your money. Well, it doesn't, Mr. Potter. In the, in the whole vast configuration of things, I'd say you were nothing but a scurvy little spider. You, you... And that goes for you, too. <laughs> in the movie, we see <clears throat> that George goes through one difficulty after another, one temptation after another. Again, he just shook hands with the devil, which represented Mr. Potter. And, uh, you know, one of my favorite scriptures is Romans 8, 28. It says, for God causes all things to happen for the good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. In other words, God is going to allow situations into our life. He's not the author of sin, but temptation and testing will come your way. But God says if you'll turn to him and trust him, trust that he's a good God, trust that he's a sovereign God, that he has your best interests in mind, that no matter what happens in life, I, know I will turn to the Lord and say, God, I will trust you. And what will be the difference is you can go through life being miserable and misunderstanding what's going on, or you can trust in God that he's a good God and he always is going to turn, even what is meant for evil, even what where when Satan tries to tempt you, if you'll turn to the Lord and respond as Jesus did, then, then God will always take and turn it and use it for good. Now, you know, it's, we, we talked earlier how Jesus was tempted just as we were tempted. He, gave, he, he became man. So, having been man, he had to live a life of righteousness. He had to live a life of obedience, perfect obedience, so he could pay for your sins and my sins. So, in Matthew chapter 4, we see that it says that Jesus was tempted just like we were tempted. And so, we're going to look at some of the temptations that we see that Satan tempted Jesus with because they're some of the same temptations that we will face. So, Matthew chapter 4, verse 2. It says, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Jesus was hungry. The tempter, which is Satan, or in the movie, Mr. Potter, the tempter came to him and says, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Now, 
Actually, there's two temptations in this verse. What are the two temptations? The first one is Satan always will tempt you in, in your identity, your self-value, your self-worth. Jesus being fully God, fully man, he knew he was the Son of God. But what Satan says, if you are the Son of God, you know, if you are. So what, what happens is, is how many of you know that we are, for those who are believers in Jesus Christ, we are God's favorite son, God's favorite children. And God loves, God doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants all to live. That's why he died on the cross. So what, what Satan's going to do is he's going to tempt you with the same conceit, that same identity. Is my life any, of any value? Uh, is, do I have any purpose? Uh, does anybody love me? You know, am I pretty? Am I handsome? Whatever it is, do you know the first thing that Satan's going to do? He's going to attack you. John 10.10 10 says this. Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. In other words, a wonderful life. But Satan comes to do what? To kill, steal, and destroy. The first temptation where Satan wants to kill, steal, and destroy is he wants to make you feel like you're no good, you're not worthy, God can't forgive you. Has anybody ever been tempted with those thoughts? We all have. So Satan's always going to try to destroy you, and ultimately at the end of the movie on Christmas Eve, George comes to the place where he says, my life's worth, not worth living, I've blown it with my family, I've blown it with the, com com the community, but George has gone through a series of, of trials. So Jesus was tempted, and what he, he was tempted with, the first one, was his carnal nature, his, his physical drives. Satan will tempt us in our physical drives, but how Jesus responded, now for him, he had been fasting four days, he's hungry. But any physical drive is an open door of temptation, and we have a choice to do either what God's will is or feed our own carnal nature. God give us the desires, but our desires, if is acted upon inappropriately, destroys people's lives as well as our own. So when Jesus was tempted with eating, he says, Satan, I know you're trying to tempt me because I'm hungry, but I'm not going to live on a piece of bread. Man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In other words, I'm not going to give in to my temptation, but I'm going to choose what God told me, and God told me right now I'm supposed to be fasting. So devil, take a hike. Right? So the next one, Matthew chapter 4, verse 8, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. In other words, Satan came to Jesus. Again, if you're the son of God, look, I'll give you everything. And, God, and he's going, hey, Satan, do you know who I am? I am the son of God. I own it all already. What are you trying to do? You will be tempted in your life that fame and success and position and title, that conceit. You know, pride manifests itself in one of two ways. It either says, I am better than and deserve more, or I am less than and not worthy of. Pride either goes one of two ways. And you'll be tempted in both ways. Either I am better than and I don't deserve this. I'm better than you. All those things. So those temptations that Jesus were faced are temptations that you will face. Now, the third temptation, again, with George, George is being tempted. George was tempted with a young girl in the movie named Viola, who was very attractive and very seductive, and he says, Viola, we're not doing this, because he chose a good name over temporary physical pleasure. Then, when Mr. Potter came after years of working in the savings and loan, he goes, George, I'm going to give you $20,000 a year. Can you imagine? 350. George would make more in one year than he had in his whole entire life. But he chose not to do it. Why? It's because he put the needs of the community, the needs of the, the savings and loan, and all the people who were, now had homes because Mr. Potter would have had them living in sheer poverty. poverty. He chose the needs of the people and even his own family over Mr. Potter. He was living in a rundown old hotel that was falling apart, but he put the needs 
of others ahead of himself. And then the last temptation is a temptation that, that Satan tempted Jesus with, but I think most of us don't see it. But it's a temptation that most of us will be confronted with, and that is the temptation to take our own life. Let's look at it. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 4, verse 6, again, Satan saying to Jesus, if you are the Son of God, he t Satan took him to the top of the temple, to the highest pillar, and says, if you throw yourself off, God will catch you. And, and, and Jesus says, I will not tempt the Lord my God. Satan tempted him with taking his own life. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. Take your own life. And Jesus says, Satan, I am not going to tempt God. Because one, I, first of all, Satan, I am a child of the king. I am the son of God. So when Satan tempts us, what he always wants us to do is get our, us, our, lose our focus for us to be thinking about what's good for me. We think sometimes, and guys, let me tell you right now, across the board in the United States, suicide is at all-time high, especially young middle school, young middle school boys in our own community, in the counties around us, there have been multiple, multiple suicides. And the thing that my, one of my goals today is for you right now, this day, to make a decision that you are worth, you are a person that has life, God loves you, God forgives you, and life is worth living, and that your life does matter. Ultimately, let's walk through some of George's history. First of all, George wanted to be a world changer. He wanted to be somebody of significance. And so he thought, that's what would make me happy. And so what happened with George? George, first of all, he rescues his brother, risks his own life, and out of it loses his ear. Later on, he can't join the military and get out of town like all the other young men do because he has a hearing problem. The next thing is George uh, is, is gone through. He works at his father's savings and loan. He's ready to go to college. He just can't wait to get out of Bedford Falls. And then what happens the day he's, he's getting ready to get on the train and there's a tragic accident and his dad dies. And Mr. Potter comes in and he's ready to shut the savings and loan down. And George has to give up going to college, going out to travel the world and stay home and take care of the savings and loan or all the people that have homes who have loans are going to lose their houses to Mr. Potter. Then finally, he makes a deal with his brother. Hey, you go off to the army. You go off to college. When you come home, it's my turn. I get to go. His brother comes home from, the, from college, and the thing is, is he brought a friend with him, his new wife. And George again now realizes his hope of ever leaving Bedford, Bedford Falls falls apart. George marries his childhood sweetheart, Mary, a highlight of his life. And then on their day that they're getting ready to, to leave, George takes all the money that he's accumulated, rather than going to college, all the monies that he's been saving to travel, and he says, I'm going to spend all $2,000. If a bank can be kept open on $2,000, you know that was worth a lot of money. When there was a, again, Mr. Potter says, I have a chance to cripple the savings and loan. He put a run on the bank saying, hey, our economy's falling apart. You better go get your money out of the bank. So Potter makes tons of money by paying 50 cents on the dollar. And George and his wife see it. And his wife, too, puts the needs of other people above their own. And George, again, is left home. And they don't even have a home to go to. They go back to this old hotel that is run down and dilapidated. And George is going, my life is never going anywhere. But he doesn't realize that right in the midst of it, it just opened his eyes. He has a wonderful life. He has the greatest wife. He has the greatest friends. He, his, his, his investment in the community is saving people's lives. It's the whole message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So George again is there. He, got, he ends up having several children. And then one Christmas Eve, one Christmas Eve, George is, here's the bad news that his Uncle Billy's lost $8,000. That $8,000 in our culture would, so he, he doesn't know what to do. 
He has nowhere he can come up with $8,000. So in desperation, he runs to Mr. Potter. You know, you remember the hand of, he, he grabs Satan's hand, Mr. Potter's hand. It's like, oh man, that's slimy. How many of you know Satan's going to tempt you? But Mr. Potter says, you know what, I finally got you. I finally got you, and I'm going to bring you down. And, and he tells George, he says, George, what, why should I loan you money? You call me a crappy old man. I've never been able to beat you. He says, what do you have to put up as collateral? Do you have anything? He says, no, I don't have anything. Do you, he says, oh, I've got a, a, a life insurance policy worth $15,000. And, and he says, Is it, does it have any, like, buildup in it? He says, well, it's worth $500. He says, so George Bailey, you want to borrow $8,000 and you want me to take $500 in collateral. George, not only what I'm going to do for you, I'm going to call the police and I'm going to call the bank examiner, and I'm going to turn you in for fraud and embezzlement, and you're going to jail. You are better off dead than you are alive. Whew. Man, again, guys, how George is going through life is he's not seeing that God's actually in the midst of what the enemies meant for evil, or life has dealt him difficulties. He, he's, he's become blind to his own wonderful life, and so what happens is George goes home, all the pressure of the bank falling apart. He blows up on his wife, blows up on his kids, and basically his wife's saying, you need to leave. Something's wrong. Making his family disasters. So in a point of lowness, his desperation, he goes out. He, he goes to a bar, Martini's Bar, and he, he, he gets drunk, gets in his car, gets in a fight in the bar because he insulted some woman. One of his, his te one of his children's teachers, he insulted him. You know, it's like, dude, when you start making bad decisions, you make one after another. And so George runs into a tree by the bridge, feeling, feeling at an all-time low. I'm not good. Nobody loves me. I've, my reputation is shot. God can't forgive me. All those things are at a culmination point. And that brings us to the point in the movie when George is walking out on the bridge and he's looking at jumping into the water. Now, remember when the little boy, you hear some voices when his little brother's sliding in. He says, you need to remember that point. See, his angel, Clarence, but their theology is a little bit different on angels in the movie. It's a fictional. Clarence, he says, I want you to remember that point when George jumps in the river to rescue his brother at the sake of his own life. Let's show the video. Guardian Angel. How did you happen to fall in? I didn't fall in. I jumped in to save George. You what? To save me? Well, I did, didn't I? You didn't go through with it, did you? Go through with what? Suicide. Oh, it's against the law to commit suicide around here. Yeah, it's against the law where I come from, too. Where do you come from? Heaven? Right away, quickly. That's why I jumped in. I knew if I were drowning, you'd try to save me. You see, you did. And that's how I saved you. Uh, uh, very funny. Your lip's bleeding, George. Yeah. I got a bust in the jaw in answer to a prayer a little bit ago. Oh, no, 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 George. I'm the answer to your prayer. That's why I was sent down here. 
How'd you know my name? Oh, I know all about you. I've watched you grow up from a little boy. What are you, a mind reader or something? <laughs> well, who are you then? Clarence Oddbody, AS2. Oddbody. AS2, what, what, what's that, AS2? Angel, second class. <laughs> so George has had an angel watching over him all the days of his life. Guys, as believers in Jesus, we believe that God has a plan. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 12 says, I know the plans that I have for you, plans to bless you, plans to prosper you. If you'll seek me, if you'll seek me with your whole heart. All of us are going to have difficulties. All of us are going to have trials. All of us are going to have temptations. What we do with those difficult times those temptations to a high degree define who we become. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this, No temptation has overtaken you except for what is common to mankind. <clears throat> just as Jesus was tempted, just as Paul and Peter and the apostles, they were all tempted. They all went through trials. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Jesus lived a lifestyle that he says that we should model. Philippians chapter 2. Jesus said this. He says that Jesus did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped or had held on to but that he emptied himself and he made himself nothing. He gave himself away so that he could save other people's lives. Again, we're going we're gonna to close. I'm going to close with prayer. But what is the response that you need to make today? The one that I most affirm want to say is that God loves you. And he has a great plan for your life. Even when you can't see it. And when life is falling apart. If you'll look to the Lord. And trust that he is able to guide you. You will be like George who has a wonderful life. So my prayer today. Is that God would open your eyes to see the wonderful life that is all around you. George's life changed in one day when he realized when God opened his eyes to the wonderful life and it changed his perspective forever. You get to hear that next week.